Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Representative Ken Weiler, I'm here to introduce House Bill 1393, which is relative to tuition payments for students attending a charter public school in the student's district of residence. Now, the, the bill that you have before you, a lot of the language is already in current law until you come down to the part in italics. This is for a very narrow situation that you may hear from later from other people that will testify where the school has no particular grade or, or type of school. If the, if the district doesn't have a particular, say it's a middle school or a, or a high school, and they're paying tuition somewhere else for every one of those students. And the cost of that tuition is likely to be the average cost per pupil running around 13000 plus presently. All right, if you're going to pay for these 10 students to go to this school at 13000 plus, and there is a charter school in your district, why don't you pay them at least 80%, which if you as a, as a school district establish a charter school within your district, and it is established by your district, you would have to pay 80% of what you pay for your other pupils. So, if you're doing that, and this charter school is within your district, it's still cheaper than what you're paying for a neighboring district, but you're paying 80% of what your average cost would be. And there are a few exceptions, and you'll hear about some of them from others, about wh why this should be so. Um, and I think Surrey Village School is one of the ones that you're probably familiar with in this, in this committee as a charter school. The, uh, Surrey was a little distance away from most of the school district they were in. It was a long bus ride for their elementary school students. They had a school building within their district. And the district said, we're closing that. The children are going to ride on a bus. And the, the parents in Surrey said, what can we do? We don't want the kids to have to go this long bus ride every day back and forth. So they established a charter school within the district. And they've been very happy with it because the children can stay locally. Um, and they, they, the class size they've adapted to for the charter school thing. Under this, they would now have to be paid 80% of what the district would pay. They're still in the district. They're attending a charter school in the district, so they would not have to be supported to the tune of 80% rather than just the money that the state would give. And so there might be other situations that arise similar, but that's one I'm familiar <coughs> with. And it would seem fair if those students were sent to another district that you should pay something comparable to what you would have paid, but still less. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. If I can't, there'll be others who hopefully will be able to. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Grenier has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you for taking that question. To understand this, I guess I'll ask this. If this legislation, this special piece here that, that you've shown us is not added, added would present statutes preclude the local officials from doing this? What they would do is they would just say, here's, where, here's our offer. You can take the bus <coughs> ride and go to here and, and, and we'll pay, uh, and it'll be within the district, but it'll be a school you don't like, or you don't like, like the ride. Or you can do whatever you want. So you say, all right, I'm sending my child to a charter school. All right, you're on your own. We're not gonna contribute anything. I mean, so just a quick follow-up. Of course. <coughs> Let me ask the question this way. What if the local school board wanted to do this <coughs> and pay the 80% less the money given to the child school? Does present statute preclude them from being able to do so? If, if, this, if, if that district <coughs> establishes a charter school, wholly owned, wholly supported by the district. Then they can't say, okay, we're just going to let the state pay for this. No, they're compelled to pay 80% of what they would for the student who's still in a regular school. If they have no particular school, then it's a different, then, then this applies. So it's pretty narrow. It would be unusual for a district not to have this particular grade. 
And in that instance, they're going to have to be paying. Uh, I represent Hampstead, New Hampshire. All their students go to Pinkerton. They pay tuition for every one of the high school students. So if, if, if the charter school that's in Kingston moves to Hampstead and says, we're going to rent space and we're going to establish a public high school or a charter high school in Hampstead, and some of the Hampstead students want to go there rather than to Derry, to Pinkerton, which is a little bit for a ride, then this would compel them to say, okay, we've got to pay this money to this charter school that's in Hampstead now because all of our students are tuition. In effect, it's a savings because now you're paying 80% rather than the full boat or whatever, and Pinkerton may even charge more than the average cost, but Pinkerton being a public academy rather than a different school district can charge whatever they want. So there'd be a savings if, in fact, the Seacoast Charter School opens up a high school in Hampstead. That would be a savings. Okay, thank you. Representative Myler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. If, I, if I'm correct, we have 90 plus supervisory unions in the state. And within those supervisory unions, we've got multiple school districts. Do you know for a fact how many of those school districts do not have secondary or elementary school districts? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, this would apply equally to uh, a charter school that was authorized by the district or by the state. Correct. Okay. And I'll go ahead. Um, the amount that the district would pay um, to another district for the pupil instead of the charter is that where the eight, you mentioned eighty percent? I'm not sure where the eighty percent comes from. The eighty percent comes from what you would pay your cost in your district. Further questions for Representative Black? That would be 80% less of what the state pays. Yes. Well, the total would be, including the, the state stipend. It's still less than what you would pay sending to another district. How much do you think is the cost of the local district? Less what the charter school already gets from the state. It'll be well. The, the cost you're paying in your district include it's roughly around four thousand something. It's on paper it's thirty four ninety five or something. But it, with the differentiated aid, the average across the state is closer to uh, four thousand six hundred, I think, that gets paid by the state in the adequacy formula. So yes. You'd adjust the adequacy formula and you can add the rest of that, but the total that was paid would be the 80%. Uh, at that, uh, Representative Myron. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then depending on how adequacy is paid, in some instances, the district collects the adequacy for the student they're sending out. <coughs> in some, in some, in some arrangements, the, the receiving district collects the adequacy as well as the tuition, but the total is something they agree to <coughs> amongst themselves. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Dean Michener with the School Boards Association in opposition to this bill. Um, this bill really ignores local control and it places a new unfunded financial obligation on local districts. RSA 189 specifies the duty of school boards to provide an education for all pupils in the district. And in meeting that obligation, districts have their own schools or through some agreement or contractual arrangement, 
a designated school of attendance for their students. That designated student is where the child has an opportunity to attend at district expense. <coughs> Other choices and options are available to the child. Homeschool, private schools, state approved charter schools. But the district has no financial obligation to fund those personal decisions. Such a new financial obligation as contained in this bill, without the local voter approval, cannot be placed on the district. And in some of your discussions, there's been some confusion about this 80% and what's actually being paid. 80% of the local tuition is what is paid for a charter school that is approved and operating local, that has gone through the local voter approval process. For charter schools approved by the state, the state is paying the amount of money. It's the adequacy money plus the differentiated aid. This bill is saying if you don't have a school in your district, then you have to pay the charter school your contractual arrangement that you were paying for where the students are attending as your designated school of attendance. That is a new financial obligation on the part of the school district. Now it does say that um, you would pay that amount of money minus the state adequacy stipend. So, I don't know, if you have a contract to pay 13000 to send the students to some district and the state's paying fifty four or something, then you're going to pay whatever that difference is. But that has come without any local voter approval of that. And it's a new financial obligation that did not exist for the school districts. <coughs> so we oppose this bill, and we hope you will find it inexpedient to legislate. So, and with that, I'll close my comments. Questions for uh, Dean Mitchner. Uh, Representative Cordelli? Madam Chair, um, uh, I'm not sure why it is a new financial obligation. If they send that child to another district, designated district, whatever, mm -hmm. they're, they're paying the 80%. To that. They're, they're paying the cost of, it's not an 80% of anything. They're paying whatever their contractual agreement okay. is for sending the student. Okay, so it could be 80%, it could be something less, or something more. It could be less, whatever they agreed to. But if the student chose not to attend there, they have no financial obligation. Further questions for Representative uh, Dean Representative Bang? This might be um, a duplication, but um, uh, Representative Cordelli's got to. The school has an obligation to educate the children, mm -hmm. or the, the, the town does. Um, the school board does. The school board does, right. And it's an obligation to educate every child. So why should it matter what school that money goes to? The schools, what matters is that the school has, the school district has ensured that there is a place, a, a school for, the, for every child to attend. And they've entered into some sort of agreement on that. That doesn't preclude the choice <coughs> of individuals to attend elsewhere. But when they make that choice, there's no financial obligation on the district. The district has available a place where students can attend school at district expense. If they choose to go elsewhere, that's fine. But it doesn't have to come at district expense. And this bill would require the district to now pay, pay for another place. My follow-up, it's still not making sense to me. Um, the another school district. Why does it matter whether it's to another school district in the academy or to a charter school? Why should it matter to the school district? Where just because they have this arrangement for most of the schools, uh, why does it mean that they can't have the same arrangement? Well, they could have the same arrangement. And if they put that into their budget and ask for local voter approval in their budget, they could do it. And I'm 
So you're saying that one of the problems here is that um, it's happening without uh, without public approval exactly. to send these kids to the charter school. Not to send the kids to the charter school. Um, there is nothing that prevents a district from approving a charter school. That, that can happen now, and it comes with voter approval. Um, when districts enter into agreements as for to create a designated school of attendance so that they have a place where all students can attend school at district expense, that opportunity exists. Parents make other choices and send their students to other places. That doesn't mean that we have to pay for those other choices because they've chosen not to go to the to the school district expense um, location. Uh, and in conclusion, <laughs> um, so there's a question. If if the bill said that the, the district Does that need to be put in here? Or no, current law allows that. That current law now allows yeah, current law, you can do that. So this would just, the, uh, the sole purpose of this is to bypass the public vote to enable the, the school district to give the same money to a charter school. Yes, this language would require the school district to make that payment. And a, a requirement that does not exist today. Uh, Representative Grassi and then Representative Brender. <clears throat> Maybe you can help me think this through. I was thinking in terms of um, area agreements between different school districts, how this bill might um, make a receiving district area um, or affect an area agreement. Yeah, well, does not operate a full-time elementary or secondary school. Um, I would, I, I would say you could argue that that language would include an AREA. And so then if uh, the district is part of an AREA and um, the, in general, there are well, there are contractual arrangements that go along with area agreements. And this would impact, um, and, and again, require an expenditure that wasn't forced prior to language such as this. So, yes, receiving districts, um, well, the receiving district wouldn't receive payment for the child that chose not to attend there. Um, and, but they wouldn't receive that payment anyways. Because the child would be, if the child enrolls in the charter school, um, they're not in the AREA, so the AREA wouldn't receive the tuition amount. And, but the district would have no financial obligation to pay for the child who's chosen to attend at a different school. Madam Chair, my question was more or less so I need to ask. Thank you. Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question. If a sending school district normally sends 20 kids to another school district, and then you decide to go to a charter school, wouldn't, this be, wouldn't the sending district have a windfall? Well, if the two students chose to attend the charter school, they wouldn't have to pay, they'd be paying for 18 students to attend wherever they send them. This bill would require them to pay for those two students now the amount that they were sending, where, what, the amount that they had agreed to pay for where they send those kids. So it would cost the district the same. Whereas if those two students attended the charter school, the district would save that money. So they see a windfall, basically. Um, okay, they'd, see, they'd have they'd have fewer than whatever they budgeted for. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Mr. Representative Laura. Hi, Laura.
Roy Heaney from uh, AFT New Hampshire, and we're in opposition to this bill. Uh, to me, it seems like the, this is, um, if a charter goes into a school that doesn't have an elementary school, it seems like this is becoming a forced agreement onto that local school district. Um, whereas that they have no local control over that charter school. Um, and like Mr. Tromley said, you know, the last two, it comes down to funding. Where are we going to find the funds? Um, but I see this as a forced agreement that now the local school district is forced to pay that amount to that charter school. Um, and I don't, I, I think that's inappropriate that they say that they shall pay. I see it as, a, as an extra mandate on those school systems. So with that, I'll close. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Green. Thank you, Quick question. So it's your, your feeling or belief that the voters have an option to vote on the tuition to the agreement or the agreed school that they send to. Whereas here, if the statute went into effect, they would not be empowered to vote whether or not to supply that extra money to the charter school. Is that, is that what you're saying? Do I understand that? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Further questions for Laura and Good afternoon, a few members. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to testify. My name is Eileen Laponis. I'm the executive director with the Hampshire Public Charter School, and surprisingly enough, we stand in support of this bill. Um, I think it comes down to a matter of equity that is being sought by um, parents in towns that they see their town tuitioning out because they don't have either um, an elementary, middle, or high school for their students. Um, whether it's economies of scale or whatever the reason, they tuition out to another district, um, oftentimes uh, to an independent academy like Pinkerton. And they are paying for the students in their district um, when they exercise uh, those agreements. Um, they would pay if the student went to the district school if they, the child <coughs> decided to leave either the independent academy or the charter school. So, and the state is paying a significant uh, portion of adequacy. So I think there's a several arguments to the unfunded mandate argument. Um, in the statute, it speaks of a shared responsibility between the districts and the state at the beginning of the statute. And I apologize, I couldn't get word up. I have the document in there. Um, if I could submit it later to cite the statute. Um, and the issue of local control is also confusing for me because when the district that doesn't have a school tuitions out, are they not giving up local control to another district, to another school board? In the case of Pinkerton, they're giving up their local control to an independent board that is not publicly elected, which is often the argument used against public charter schools. So I think it comes down to equity and how a district that has a shared responsibility with the state chooses to discriminate against a public charter school when they don't discriminate in their agreements with other districts or other independent academies. Um, both the district and the charter school and the independent academy all report and are accountable to the state DOE in different manners of accountability, but they all are accountable to the state board to the Department of Education because they are public schools funded with public dollars, whatever the different formulas may be. Um, so that's what I think it comes down to. And this was brought up um, from parents who live in their town. If the school that their child was going to closed and a charter school opened up and they send their child to that charter school successfully, they don't understand why the money that they pay in the taxes doesn't follow their child if their town is supporting students to go to another district. Um, so there will be written testimony submitted by um, Tora Fiore from the Surrey Village Charter School. She was unable to attend because of an eye appointment that she had to maintain. But she's got one of the best examples. Um, and in closing, I will say that there are charter schools that have arrangements with the districts in various forms <coughs> where the districts do participate and send local tax dollars to the charter schools in many different arrangements. But to quote one, which he said they, they could use, it's the right thing to do. It's a public school. These are our kids. They're going. Um, 
I thought it was pretty simple. I didn't realize it was going to draw the attention it did. Um, and the other thing, I think I may have missed an amendment, but the 80%, I'm confused on that as well because there are the two different arrangements. If it's a district authorized school, the district is required to pay the charter school, which is also independently run by an independent board of trustees, 80% um, that they did authorize locally. With the state authorized schools, they receive all their money just directly from the state. So I may have missed an amendment, I'm not sure. But I was confused on the 80% as well. 80%, whatever the contract is, these schools could do something. And the parents think they deserve it. That's all I got. <coughs> I'll put in. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for the education committee. Um, yeah, I'm co sponsor on this bill, but I think everybody's missing the point on the questions. The dis school district, the sending school district, has budgeted money, we'll say, for 50 kids to go to this school district. They don't have a school. So maybe five of those kids are going to go to a charter school. That sending school district now has a windfall of five kids tuition that they don't have to spend. And I think that's a point because here they budgeted for 50. They're only spending 45 and so what are they going to do? They're going to probably try to get all their kids to go to a charter school. <laughs> then they don't have to spend anything. So what's yeah. fair is fair. Senator Barish, she has a question for you, Representative. Thank you. Once a school district has settled a budget, say for 50 kids, there's nothing to say that 10 more kids won't move into that district or 10 kids move out of the district. Either way, you're either facing a shortage or a windfall. Either way. So I think that your argument about sending five kids to a charter school, you know, those things happen in school districts all the time. Right, but the point is here, they know, say for example, hey, all these kids are going, they all graduated, say, from the eighth grade of this school, and we know we have 50 kids, and, they're, and they we're going to budget that much. Yeah, yes, there's always comes and goes and whatnot, but, but the point is, is it's still going to end up being, hey, good, lucky, they've got to go to charter school, and we don't have to pay for it. Is it not true that without this law, they could still pay the charter school? It's not, it's, it's not a private school. It's a charter school. I didn't think that. I thought that's what Isn't it true that without this bill, that community could already pay the charter school? Yes. Yeah. 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 If, the, if they budgeted it as such, if they didn't budget it as such, they couldn't. But they Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for taking my question. This is not about the money or money saved. It's purely um, this concern. If a sending district s did send their students to five different schools, whatever the agreement, there would be, I believe, a vote by the residents to approve each of those five schools. And if could you comment on my concern that the one, and it's the one issue I have here, is that this bill now says that if one of them is a charter school, in this particular example, that the voters would vote on the other four but would have no say on this bill. Is, 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 is that how I, it is? And am I understanding well, I'm look, going back to my, my school that before we had our own high school, we were sending so many kids to Hudson and so many kids to Manchester, and it wasn't an area agreement, it was just a tuition agreement that was done every so many years, and it was um, basically no less than 75% to Hudson and no more than 25% to Manchester. The, and, and they changed depending on what. And, but we had a lot of kids, so a couple here and there isn't going to matter. But if you have a small number of kids, 
and and most budgets are going to say it be one line budget saying tuition to high school or whatever to t not to in, in each individual school it'll be the, on the budget will be a total tuition rate a total tuition amount that's going to be paid for tuition and if some of those kids 10 percent don't go to one of those public schools they go to a charter school instead then the budget has got hey we got extra money Uh, I, I understand that, but the one thing that's, that's just hard for me is if we require the voters, and, and whether it's a tuition agreement or what kind of agreement, I believe that the district is supposed to have the opportunity, the voters, to approve each of these agreements. Whereas, what I mentioned, if four of the schools they vote on, but this exception now, they don't have a right to vote on. And, and that's just my concern. But, Mike? But that's okay. my, my end of that is this will happen after the fact, after the voting, after the budget's approved. Thank you for your testimony, and I'm going to close.